Okay, we're back. We're live. It's uh, it's a Thursday morning. It's a coronavirus, a coronaville. Pardon me. What's next? Title of our show is uh, is uh, is Trump back to his own tricks, his old tricks on on COVID, and uh, it sounds like he is. Um, but you know what? What uh, what is interesting? And you were talking about this before the show, Tim. That's Tim Abicella, uh and uh, and Stephanie Dalton. Um, so you were talking about the book that you're reading the Mary Trump book, which may explain some of these machinations. Um, and I, you know, I guess it's worth talking about some of the bizarre things in the context of that book. What does that book tell us about bizarre things on, on behalf of our president? Well, Jay, I wish I could go into detail, but I just came from Amazon as of this morning. So I will read you the first paragraph on the back of the, uh, the cover. And I think it does explain a lot of things why this mishandling of the COVID-19 is been gone horribly wrong and has resulted in already 151,000 American deaths. So here's what uh, she wrote on, uh, about Donald Trump. Today, Donald is as much as he was as three years old, incapable of growing, learning, evolving, unable to regulate his emotions, moderate his responses, or take in and synthesize information. Yeah, he, he's, he's, uh, he's learned under his father to lead a cheating life. Cheating is the highest value, and uh, you know I've heard her many times on, on on the national media talking about her book, and I I have it also, and I, I find it very easy to read. I find it very valuable, and and it does explain some of the bizarreties. But let's talk about the bizarreties. So last week he he read something. Maybe it was the beginning of this week. He read something off a teleprompter, and it sounded pretty rational. But since that time, he's uh, he's declined. He's back to his old tricks making ridiculous thing, statements and doing ridiculous things. Can you talk about some of the madness here, Stephanie? Well, I know that uh, he's, uh, he was parented very badly and uh, the mother was very, very ill at the time of his early, early life, like four or three, before he settled into, as Tim read about. But he was not getting that kind of nurturance and the dad was just a loser at it. it, it I mean, he was a 50s dad, 40s, 50s dad. So he did what those dads did, just not paying any attention. And, and then the man himself was devoid of some of the, the uh, nurturant kinds of uh, uh, temperaments and, and personalities and, and just spent no time with him. Well, how does that translate into what he's doing now? <clears throat> I mean, is, is he doing distraction? He's lying. He's doing these stupid grandstand things in the Rose Garden. Uh, he's I not addressing it. He's he's completely ineffectual in developing a plan, either on the COVID or on the on the economy. I mean, these things are all bizarre. And and you wonder, you know, if in his, his little mind there, um, you know, which of course he passed the test about the elephant, so he must be okay. Uh, <clears throat> In his little mind, whether he's got some some reason, whether there's a, a method behind the madness. I mean, arguably, he'd like to see the chaos. Uh, you know, chaos is better for dictators. He'd like to see a real mess by election time, both in COVID and, and the economy, where he can where he can, I don't know, somehow make capital out of that. But what is what are the crazy things he's been doing lately? Well, everything he's been doing all along and that he's learned since he was very small and watching the other children, but he cannot abide any uh, assault on his uh, being. Um, he cannot take any of uh, criticism or feedback or direction. He is only moving around in the, you know, from sweet leaf to sweet leaf leaf and once one is no longer sweet he moves on or he deflects it or he ignores it so it, he he doesn't have that that foundation of self-confidence that gives him a margin to to use to absorb these kinds of things that happen to all of us and then he watches the other kids get beaten up or get rejected and he just will ignore that and have no empathy for it either so he's missing I think what um, is, is being shown, what he's enacted, the very thing she talks about in the book, is she talks about the developmental sequence towards that. And what now he's doing is the same thing. He's just like the same kid. One pile of mess over here until he starts getting that. Then he moves over to the next pile, then the next pile, then he makes the next mess. So by the time anybody can intervene, the, the point of intervention is now eight messes behind the current one. That he's a master of the news cycle. Yeah, Tim. He's just you a know. master 
as you say, of doing that, that kind of stuff. So no adults have been able to help. And then everybody's enabling him because they don't know what else. There's nothing else to do. So that was the surprise of the, sis, of the niece saying, why, ha, why is he continuously enabled? So that's what's her, her what she hasn't figured well, out. There seems to be a crack in the wall, Tim. Yeah, I, I, just to tag on with Stephanie is, if you really look at his last three and a half years, in her last, um, in that one paragraph, she says, he's incapable of taking in and synthesizing information. So look at the COVID reports and, and, and the COVID data, the deaths and the cases around the world and the United States within each state. He's unable and incapable of, 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 of being able to process that and then develop a policy that counteracts it. Look at the, uh, the executive uh, presidential briefings. He doesn't read them. He can't take it in. And so what results from that? Well, it was recently uh, the, the fact that Russia is paying a bounty on uh, the deaths of U.S. soldiers. That was in his prep freezing. Uh, and he, he can't take it in. He, he, can't, he can't process it. So here's a classic example of what she's referring to in this book. Yeah. You know, uh, <clears throat> but looking at the, the metrics here, where you, you, you said it at the beginning, it's 151,000 um, deaths in this country. And I hold him responsible for those deaths. He was there at death number one, at case number one, and he really hasn't done anything. He's been always going the wrong direction, always making these huge lies, huge mistakes uh, in dealing with it. And I've been meaning to ask you guys this question for a long time. Can you please count for me 150,000, just start now. Do the math, how long that would take. Um, you know, there, if there are 3,600 seconds in an hour, or in our case for half an hour, there are 1,800 seconds, it would take you, huh, how many shows? How many, how, many, how many shows? It would take you 75 shows or more to read the names of all the people who have died here. It's extraordinary. There's three times as many people that died in Vietnam. <laughs> in well, Vietnam. Jay, Jay, I saw something in the paper because it addresses this very thing is the, the American public has been desensitized to the number. And so to put it into layman's terms, how many airliners filled with passengers would go down each and every day to equal 151,000? And then once that number was obtained, maybe America, the United States, the red states would understand and grasp the gravity of, of this whole situation and treat it a little bit more seriously. Well, Absolutely. sadly, 9-11 count of names, re re reading out names has been canceled. So you know how long it takes to read out 3,000 right there. So would, that would take months to go through the reading out of all the names of people who have been lost. So yes. well, unnecessarily. Um, and, and yet, there, you know, there are people in this country, including many public officials who are in his administration, um, who uh, oppose wearing masks. It's been politicized um, and it is still politicized. For so many people. You know, even worse, let me add that there was a piece last week um, about, about anti-vaxxers and 20 percent of the country, according to this poll by I think it was The Guardian, um, would, are anti-vax and they would oppose taking the vaccine. You realize how deadly that is if you have a pandemic, they would re refuse to take the vaccine and that would, that would really not achieve immunity. I mean, community immunity that would stand in the way. I mean, these people really ought to be, I'm sorry, but locked up. I mean, if this is a public emergency, I don't know why this administration is not taking you know, uh, the steps that are strong. Every single country in, in, in Asia has better numbers than we are. Some of them fractionalized. Vietnam has never had a death. Singapore, I think 34, maybe, that's all. Maybe less. Um, Japan, just, just a handful. Uh, and China, after all the tumult there at the beginning with all the lockdown and everything, they, they didn't have a lot of deaths. Um, Korea, the same thing. Um, so, I mean, we are so far behind in so many huge multiples of the deaths that any country in, in, in Asia and most of the countries in Europe too. We don't know how to flatten the curve. We never did flatten the curve. I remember how, um, 
how amazed I was when he got up there and said, we're going to reopen now. And then think of all the ways he has pushed that and is still pushing that. And, and I think this goes back to uh, Mary Trump's book. He doesn't have a handle on things. He doesn't know how to deal with this at all. And, and the results are um, obvious. So, um, okay. So um, is there a plan? And to what extent is the plan? Does the plan come from him? And to what extent is the plan being implemented? Or is there not a plan? Is it not, is it not being implemented? Do we have 50 plans maybe? Or 50 plus all the cities? You know, there are a lot of jurisdictions lower than a state jurisdiction. So, I mean, how are we doing? Can you comment on that, Tim? I think we have a political plan to a non-political virus. And I think that's been the case since day one. And I believe that um, Donald Trump only had one thing on his mind. And Jay, you and I did that interview back in early March. Um, I was in Seattle and uh, you, were, you were here and there was um, just outside of Seattle, I had eight COVID cases or eight deaths at that time. And, and what we said back then is true today. And that was Donald Trump only cares about his reelection. And he knew that the economy and the Dow Jones and the NASDAQ was tied to his reelection. And so he would say and do anything to make sure the financial markets would not go in a decline into a free fall. Now we did that interview, I think it was on March the 4th and uh, the Dow had dropped 3000 points at that point. But he was willing to say that it's, it's you know temporary, we're gonna lock this thing down. Um, we'll have a virus cure, we'll have a vaccine within months. And it was just around that time, Dr. Fauci, who just arrived on the scene said, no, uh, by the time you develop, by the time you manufacture, by the time you distribute, we're gonna be into 12 to 18 months. So that was Dr. Fauci's first entree with the, in a dispute in the room uh, with, the, with Donald Trump. And so it's always been a political game rather than a, a, a public health crisis. Well, and I don't, I don't think that's changed. I don't think that's changed one bit. Yeah. The big, the big news today is that he is talking and tweeting about, about po postponing the election. He's not getting a lot of resonance on that, certainly not from the Democrats and not from the Republicans either. But can you, um, you know, give us the context of that against his um, abiding desire to win this election and stay in office? Well, I think he needs more time. We're now down to 96 days before the election. Uh, he realizes that he has missed uh, some critical deadlines about trying to turn these polls around. He realizes that he's taken the wrong position on how to combat COVID, uh, particularly with masks. Uh, he's turned that into a, com a complete political uh, football to be played with. And uh, as I said, not wearing a mask is equivalent to wearing a mega hat. And he, he loves that stuff, but he realizes that the poll numbers are not going to shift in his favor. Therefore, he needs more time to basically come across in a genteel way of saying, mea copa. Now I'm taking this virus seriously and we're gonna clamp it down. November the 3rd will come by far too fast for that to happen. Yeah, you mentioned before the show that Deborah Burks had said something about everybody should wear a mask now. Uh, is that from her or from him or both? That's a good question. Um, we'll find out because I think if she came up with this on her own and, and, and again, she's, she's asked both states and municipalities to mandate mask wearing, uh, if Donald Trump did not give her those marching orders, you can count on uh, her being put put in a corner somewhere, just like he's done with Dr. Fauci. You know, Stephanie, we need to know more about the science here. I mean that in every sense of the word. And, um, you know, that there was an article a, a few days ago, I think it was in, um, I think it was in either the Guardian or the, no, it was in the Atlantic. It was in the Atlantic. And it, it, it said something about, let's do a reality test on vaccines. And, and they pointed out in this article, and it was very well written as everything in the Atlantic, um, that uh, you know, we, we can't be sure about this vaccine. We can't be sure about any part of it. You know, not the testing, not the efficacy, not the, not the safety, um, how, you know, how you distribute it, how you finish it. I mean, remember they're doing hacking, Russia's doing hacking in our test results. We have international competition instead of international collaboration. I wonder if uh, I wonder if Trump discussed that with Putin in his meeting a few days ago, his secret meeting, you know, where he says, "Oh, I can't tell you about that. It's just it's just personal, me and Putin." Are you kidding? You know, you're a head of state. You were elected. 
um, or if you were elected, <laughs> I'm not sure of that. But but okay. Bottom line is um, the article was very skeptical on whether you know what was being fed to us about the uh, the possibility of a, a vaccine, even by Anthony Fauci, was really something we could rely on. Uh, at the best of it, it's going to be a year away from now. Um, but where are we? Can you talk about therapeutics? Can you talk about the vaccine? Well, according to his topic with Putin, um, well, I don't know if he spoke about it, but Russia's two weeks away. So we're on countdown to two weeks uh, from what yesterday or whatever, when he said they are having a vaccine produced in within two weeks, according to Putin. Now, is that that from his discussion or is that just out of his head? The other point is that no matter the science, no matter what we know, he cannot understand it, comprehend it, absorb it. And uh, that's, uh, I, I mean, a fi- it ought to be a firing offense if somebody doesn't read their morning daily bulletin of the, the CIA and that system of network intelligence. He's not, that he can answer a question and say, I didn't, I don't know that, that never got to me. I don't have any recollection of that. I, I mean, that really is a, a firing offense. Imagine if your colleague or or somebody you work closely with said that every time you asked a question. I mean, that is not okay. So I thought it was interesting that in the Axios interview that they showed pieces of, I guess, yesterday, you may have noticed that he was asked directly, do you read the morning briefing report? There's a an acronym for that, that he gets every single morning, every single president and everyone designated at that level gets that top secret report. And he said, yes, I read it. I can read. Contrary to what everybody says, I can, and I am a very good comprehender. I have good comprehension. I understand. I'm a, I'm a stable genius too. And the Axios it just can kind of continued on. But, uh, you know, he's very, very much yeah, on. Let's get back to the question. It, it, there was no discussion at that meeting, as far as I know, about, about vaccines you know, and oh, it's, uh, it's, about it's, collaboration. In fact, you know, it's been reported that Russia has been hacking on us and maybe China has been hacking on us, too, to get our test results. Well, that tells you a bunch of things. It means that we're not collaborating. We're competing. And, and uh, there are tech people out there, you know, a la... Cambridge Analytica, you know, using information against us, not only to undermine our elections, but to undermine and, and, and compete with us on development of the vaccine. But, you know, we have Moderna, right, Tim? And Moderna has some promising candidates. My recollection is that altogether we have something like 150 candidate vaccines, but they're only really in trials on about 30 of them. Uh, and maybe Moderna has the, the most advanced. Um, but and they're supposed to go into, according to uh, Tony Fauci, supposed to go into uh, level three trials here uh, in the next few weeks, uh, in September, I think. Um, and, and that, you know, takes us further, although, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the trials. And we don't know that whether it's going to work or they're going to have to, you know, and, and Trump is doing his warp speed thing. I don't, he, I don't think he knows what he's talking about, but uh, so where are we on this? Uh, you know, can well, you- I, I, I think, you know, the faster we go to the future, the further we go back in time. Um, I'm going to bring up Louis Gohmert, Representative Louis Gohmert, who's, who has been loyal Trump acolyte. And now he's come down with uh, COVID-19. And he is following the playbook. And that is, don't worry about a vaccine in the future. We know what we have right now available is the cure. And that is um, hydrochloroquine. And, and we know that it doesn't work. Dr. Fauci has said it repeatedly through uh, clinical trials, it is not effective against this virus. Yet Louis Gohmert, who now is contracted, said, I'm gonna use it. Donald Trump said, I've used it. I think it was beneficial. And so that's the only miracle drug that they can use between now and 97 days to say, see, we told you we've been on top of this all along. And if you had just listened to us, um, we'd be a lot further along and we wouldn't have had the 151,000 deaths of American citizens. So yeah, he's trying, trying to do what he did before, rely on hydroxychloroquine. Okay, and his son uh, was out there on the media. He was tweeting and sending videos out. And I forget whether it was Facebook or Twitter, probably Twitter, caught him off. They said hydroxychloroquine has been shown, you know, been debunked. 
and you're still talking about it, you're misleading the people. You can't do that. They cut you know, in the old days, they used to call that snake oil salesman. Yeah. But uh, Trump, Trump is still pushing on that. And you're right. I think that's, that's his ace in the hole because he got nothing else. Um, and, and I don't think the vaccine is something else that we can really count on, neither in, in timing uh, or in how long it works on you, if it works at all. Um, and you know, bottom line is we have, we have a problem in terms of dealing with the vaccine as we see it now. So mm, this is going to have a bad ending. I mean, where, where, where somebody estimated yesterday on MSNBC that by the end of the year, we'd have 800,000 deaths, a doctor. You know, it's not just the 800,000 deaths, it's the 800,000 deaths plus the families that have been affected by this, the, you know, the grandkids, the children, the sons, the daughters, the wives, you know, the whole family units and neighbors. Um, you know, you take one death and you replicate it in a community and it's, it's tenfold uh, of, of the impacts of, of death. And, you know, it's tragic and it was unnecessary. And I agree with you from your, your initial comment on this show is I hold Donald Trump directly responsible for a majority of these deaths. I do. And I always have because he's avoided the true problem. And that is it's a virus, not a political football. So we have an economy that's in free fall, Stephanie. Can you talk about that? You know, where is it going? If we're having this increase, this dramatic increase in the number of cases all over the country, as opposed to other countries, which have flattened the curve, we haven't. We're, we're shooting up like stars. Um, we're logarithmic already. And there's no sign of it slowing down, largely because people insist on, on not abiding by social distancing and not wearing masks, and even now. So wh where's our economy going here and how does that affect us? Well, I think that might have had to do with his announcement of postponement because uh, Bloomberg uh, reported that this is a, is a decline or shrinkage in the GDP, uh, the worst since the 29 uh, problems, the problems with the depression. I mean, it was really scary this morning in, in a couple of ways. So um, the market was only down about 100 points and it's, I think it's tripled by now. But anyway, so I think he heard that because this is a marker of that second quarter and that, that, that the toll that that took. And of course, it hasn't gotten any better. So I'm thinking that he may have been motivated out of that bad news, very bad news to, to make that, to bring up another point, another, what we're calling shiny objects, but this time the changing of the, of the uh, election date. But um, yeah, so I think that it's gonna get worse. And I think we're facing a calamity, all of us. I, I, all of us, I mean, I really had a moment and I think we all are gonna have moments of where are we going with this? It's such a good question, Jay, because unless we get the Russian vaccine or the other vaccines, or can we hold till next year? Because what's that song in, in Hamilton? Like, what did I miss Jefferson sing while he was in France and the revolutionary was going on? We, we don't know what these vaccine people have missed, you know, who are revving it up. What was the stage? Of the, of the experimental trial that was missed. Something was missed if you're only doing it next amount of time as Fauci has already schooled us all on. So I just wanted to say that I am concerned. I think that that might be working around. That's a, a real darkness there. And then the other news this morning, I haven't heard anybody mention, but Herman Cain died of COVID. And he was at the Tulsa uh, uh, rally. I, I really was taken aback by that. He was there, most people were uncovered. Now that, that must be the bellwether of a whole host of other numbers coming out of there. But um, I, I, that's a shocker. So we've had three big shocks this morning and your question asks us all to be reflect and maybe get ready for some rough times and we're gonna have to hang on for this vaccine. The real- well, What are the rough times, Tim? Let's look at the- um... I don't know if it's the worst case analysis, but the likely analysis going forward. I mean, the Congress is broken on this. Uh, the Republicans, um, maybe, I don't know if you talked about this on your show the other day, um, but the Republicans are coming apart. 
Um, and uh, maybe we see cracks in the wall, the Republicans. They disagree, for example, about postponing the election. But there are other things. And uh, some of them, are, well, they can't come to agreement on the next, uh, the next uh, you know, tranche of money. Uh, this is a real crisis. So we may not have uh, agreement or we may have a, a negotiated result, which is way, way down the, from before. And then you have people, may I say, starving around the country. There's no safety net anymore. And then you have like 40 million people who are off because of job situations, they're off healthcare and they stand the risk of getting sick in the hospital. No insurance company to pay for that, no healthcare. <clears throat> it's really in, in a hard time. So uh, query, what happens when all these vectors come together, together. a confluence of negativity, thank you to Donald Trump. What happens in the streets? Well, I'm going to take um, Winston Welch's path of optimism. And I'll, I'll remind him of Dickinson's quote, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. You've already described the worst of times, and they're going to get worse. You're going to see a lot more economic disparity. You're going to see a lot more people thrown out of their homes. You're going to see a lot more people who die from COVID. You're going to see a lot more of, of unemployment and all the things that follow with unemployment. But if you think about it, if people go out and vote and vote Trump out of office, this could be a very formative transformance of, of our government, of our society. Not too dissimilar with that what happened when Richard Nixon resigned. We went through a pain, we went through a lot of pain, but as a result, a lot of new laws were developed to protect graft and corruption uh, in government and, and, and um, abuse of, of, of federal agencies. And I think we're gonna be in that time again, where we're gonna see what went wrong with Donald Trump, how Donald Trump gamed the system, and how we could put in preventative stopgap measures to prevent a future president from doing the same thing. So I, I see a mixture of positive uh, transformation for this society, this government, and then I see the horrific changes that are on the horizon. And they're not good, and they're, they're very bleak. Well, I think part of your answer assumes that he will lose. But he's making every effort. He he's not going to stop in these 97 days to try to you know, uh, ameliorate his situation on the polls and and with, with voters. So just let me shift the facts a little bit. Uh, suppose he's able to avoid the election, uh, even if he would lose, um, postpone it, what have you, contest it, go to court about it, delay inauguration. I know S Nancy Pelosi is supposed to step in if there's no other president elected and all that. Um, but <clears throat> let's take a, a look at that possible assumption of fact. Let's assume that he either stays in office or he actually gets out of office, but then he's still a voice to his base, causing trouble and consternation. Um, that makes the scenario, which I think is a little optimistic, um, less optimistic, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, in fact, I think your second scenario that he he's still a voice, I, I fully, if Donald Trump loses this election, which I pray he does, I, I think he'll start his own TV network. And it'll be <laughs> not dissimilar to Alex Jones or Rush Limbaugh, that type of um, personality that will always stir his loyal base into, um, you know, almost anarchy against the existing form of government. And he'll, he'll enjoy that for the remaining of his life. And so I think that's the likely scenario. And I don't think we get rid of that. No, and we have to, you know, return to the way it was, or at least the way we'd like, like it to be, as you say. Um, but that's not an easy job. We were talking last hour to uh, Sylvia Luke, who chairs the uh, not only the House Finance Committee in the uh, White Legislature, but also the, the Special Select Committee on COVID. And it uh, became clear to me that uh, when, when things go bad like this, if, in order to fix them, there's huge amounts of work to be done because you have to repair all of the holes in the boat. You have to, you have to fight the same fights you were fighting before, again, against people who are not going to agree with you. And, and that's the way it's going to be after this election, whatever happens. So um, all I'm saying is we have our work cut out for us, even in, in the best scenario. So let's talk about the future. Let's talk about this week, because what we have, I mean, next week, what we have this week, uh, Stephanie, is uh, more of his old tricks, more of his distractions, more of his, his lies. And um, what's going to happen coming? Um, is it more of the same or will he come up with something brand new? 
Well, I'm hoping that somebody will explain to Mr. Donald Trump that the next person to become president, if he does not have the election, is Nancy Pelosi. And there's nothing he can do about that since that is hardwired and a line item, so to speak, in the Constitution. So I bet that he doesn't understand the succession under those. What's, what's going to happen, Stephanie? And he was, so what's going to happen is he's going to find out about that and he's going to start other stuff. Okay. So that's what he does. He can't absorb that as we know now. And it's validated by the, the study in the book of the knees. So he cannot manage that. So he moves on to something else and he continues to pull the whole house down. So there he hit the election. Now what's the next thing? So, and it'll be every other day or probably every day, we're going to have 90 of these things. Yeah. In. Yeah, we, and we still have, he still has a, a, a devoted ally in uh, William Barr. We've seen that uh, even this week in testimony in Congress. So Barr will support him no matter what. What do you think, Tim? Tim is it I, I think, more of the think, same or what? No, I, I think we have 97 day window of that will shape what we're looking at. So, what's the fastest way to reduce COVID infection? Mass. We know that will be the fastest way to do it. So, therefore, um, I see in the next week or so, um, the administration now really starting to promote the use of masks indoors and outdoors. And I believe that Donald Trump will reluctantly go with that only because he knows that's the fastest way to get to his 97 day turnaround. And that's the only reason why he would support it. What's he going to be doing about the stock market? Because, uh, you know, all the predictions are is that if, the, if you don't fund um, these efforts, social safety net, what have you, if more people are out of work. The I stock think market is bound to go down. What can he do about that? I, I think it's the same thing he tried to do in March. And, and he even said it himself. I'm a cheerleader. That's what I do. And he's going to cheerlead more, um, you know, miracle cures. And he's going to cure uh, falling rates of case infections because he's the great Donald Trump. And therefore, that's why he should be reelected. So he's going to promote the same and just be more of a cheerleader about it. You know, there's a whole momentum thing about this COVID business. That is, whatever you say, whatever he says, it doesn't take root immediately. It's, there's a delay of weeks. It's like Tulsa. You know, before Cain died, it was a, how much? It was a month at least, um, you know, after Tulsa. And I'm sure there are a lot of cases out there now that are just coming around, just ripening, and incipient deaths that are just ripening because of Tulsa. So what you say, what you do in this context and I think that's why he's concerned about, you know, the shortness of time and, and has, how he has to uh, catch up somehow, because he knows that there's a delay on everything. And uh, I can't say what it is, but I can say this. It's, it's weeks at least. And so we, we're going to see him really get desperate. Don't you agree, Stephanie? I certainly do, Jay. I, I really do, especially as the uh, tally continues to, to swerve upward at a rate that's unimaginable. And uh, what may, will that, and as the Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan said, there are no numbers. There is no number of bodies that will make this man consider the welfare of our children, much less the rest of the people. There's no amount. So don't expect it and don't wait for it. You've got to get on with the plan. Just nevertheless, go. nevertheless, there's plenty going to happen, I'm sure, between now and next Thursday. So be prepared, be watching, and we'll have a continuation of this conversation. Thank you, Stephanie. Very nice to have you. And Tim, what a delight to have you on the show. Thank you Take for having care, me, Take care, both of you. Stay well. Aloha. Aloha.